And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, the man behind 1879, or at least one of the man, one of the mans behind it. Yes, mans, I said that. Um, <laughs> and cur and currently developing the players and GMs companions, respectively. The one and only Brad Decker. How are you doing tonight, man? I am doing just fine. Thanks for mm -hmm. having me. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, so I like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Taking that into account, um, what was your first introduction to role playing games, and what? made it stick for you? Uh, for me personally, uh, I started way the heck back in childhood in Scouts, um, mm -hmm. when, where we'd have free time during our campouts and that sort of thing. I, you know, We'd jump in, we'd just start playing games. We'd have characters that would just go on and on and on. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, bounce back and forth. Uh, I just loved the open format uh, of games where you, know, you could just do anything, whatever your imagination came up with. It was just, okay, roll the dice. Let's see how it works. Uh, and it just continued to carry that on and on uh, as I've gone through both as a player and as a uh, developer. Yep. Um, now with the, now with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, what like what was there was there a certain niche that you felt that you fell into in your in your early days that you kind of um, branched away from because it's it's always interesting to see the to see. Um, where th where that first step was, and whether or not somebody stuck within that net or broke out of it. Well, uh, first games, of course, I was introduced mm -hmm. to was Dungeons and Dragons. I mm -hmm. think that's the same for pretty much everybody in the industry. I'd like or... to I'd like to say that's the case, but I've had some exceptions over the years. There's a couple, and you know what? More power to them. D and D's great for what it is, but uh, me personally, and, and where I did get you know, delving into that, where mm -hmm. I kind of get into my niche, I tend to like a lot more of the crunchier systems. Um, I, I'm a heavy math nerd, so I like a system that is mathematically elegant that, that ties into that sort of thing and brings those mechanics in with the game design. Um, and that was uh, once I had branched out of there, um, and once I got into FASA games, mm -hmm. the rest was history yeah. <laughs> for that one. I, I, you know, I fell in love with the entire system oh, ever you since I started playing it. When you mentioned Crunchy, were were you one of those people who was who was um who was buried under a mountain of Hero and Gurps books? I tried to <laughs> avoid that, you know, not, not, not be completely buried, but you know, I, I still have a bunch of my old collection. Uh, yeah, I. I have had to. Uh, it's a good thing I'm a woodworker in my spare time because I've had to build some shelves. <laughs> it's like you're saying that you try that you tried to avoid that, but I'm not exactly convinced, and I'm not exactly you're convinced yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I try to at least give myself a where I get out of the room. Yeah. Um, I'm just. I'm just saying. I, I'm just saying. I could see. I could see a. I could see a, a pile of books, books over your over your desk to the point where if I'm standing in front of your desk, I can't see you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's um, kind of where things end up going. Yeah. Or, I mean, I could I could bring up riffs, but um, if you but let's be honest, if you were doing that with with riffs or anything palladium, um, I'd end up having to make the cons the conspiracy math guy meme. Where where you've got all all these different notes that just show all of your house rules for running riffs, right? Exactly. Well, I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. it gets to the point where you might as well just divide, you know, design your own system because you've done so much math and you're you're house ruling so many things. Yeah, um, I don't know about you, but house ruling should. I've always described house ruling as a spice. Like as much as I, as much as I love paprika in dishes. You're not going to drown your dish in paprika. Unless no, you've got exactly. no taste. Um, exactly. Although, I mean, if you want to create your own dish, hey, go for it. <laughs> that is that, totally good one. Yeah. Um, but how, um, what was your introduction when it came to getting in with um, FASA? So FASA, like many 
uh, people I started out with Earth Dawn. Um, I mm -hmm. think it's probably split with Fossa, at least for the the newer comers uh, between Earth Dawn and uh, Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the older there was a bunch of older games back in the day. Um, but I uh, and, and this one I remember very well. It was actually the first time I was introduced to Andrew Lagan, who was the line developer for 1879 before me. Mm -hmm. um, it was New Year's Eve of 2005, going into 2006. Yep. Um, we, we had gotten, I had been introduced to some friends. We got together. Mm -hmm. We had an all weekend gaming session. We had uh, like three days just running through, you know, me as a brand new character and just all day running through the, these game sessions. Mm -hmm. Fell in love with the system, fell in love with their group, uh, and just have continued from there. That character is still alive, by the way. Uh, and that, after all this time, that character does still exist. There's a, there's a, oh, miracles can happen. Exactly. So, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, uh, but, but yeah, just fell, as like I said, once it came into the mechanics end, I, I started getting into the dice system. I absolutely fell in love with it. it you know, you'd, you'd from after playing D20 mm -hmm. systems all this time, in, 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 in the handful of D6 systems, whenever you get somebody who is going into those, you finally get to a system that's like, hey, I get to use all the dice. This is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, that's what's i what's kind what's kind of funny about the about the step system that um that's that's used with 1879 and used with um earth dawn is it decides to be a little more honest about its about its die system cuz consider the d20 system it calls itself that but in reality you're when i think of a when i think of a die system that says that kind of thing you'd think okay you're only going to be using the d20 not the case <laughs> Never, never been the case, which is, which is why, um, which is why calling it a calling it a D twenty system is a um, bit of a misnomer. But with Fossa, it's like, yeah, with with um the step system, yeah, you're using all you're using all the dice. Um, I think the only other game I can the only other game recently I can think of that goes with that whole use all the dice kind of approach is Lex Arcana, and that's a whole other beast. But what 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 exactly drew you to 1879? Uh, so, for one, I have always been a fan of steampunk. Mm -hmm. um, that is one of the major motifs of the uh, the game system. Um, of course, there's been steampunk games on on the street beforehand. Um, yeah. But where we really get uh, sort of a customized flair to this um, is just with, with the mix of things we've got involved. So, mm -hmm. so we have steampunk. You know, it's right at that peak of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of real-world history that we tie into the game. But there's also, uh, we're throwing you know those fantasy elements in because there is magic being introduced yeah. uh, to the system. So, so you actually do have access to spells and that sort of thing. And there's an entire other world that you have access to. It's not just played on Earth. You actually mm -hmm. have a portal with another world you can go to. So yes. there's just this nice eclectic mix of things brought in. Uh, so it, and it gives you such a variety and, and it allows us to create such a rich universe for people to play in. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in you know, any different ty you know, type of campaign you want to do, you can go through. Um, this really is kind of the replacement for Shadowrun within our cosmology. So if you wanted to do a steampunk Shadowrunner game, you can do that. We have things you know, with the great game and, and the, you know, the gentleman's role, industrial espionage, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You can do those sort of things. Yeah. Um, if you want to just play Pulp Adventure, we've got a world on the other side of the portal. You can go over there. There's dragons and all kinds of crazy critters, and, and it's just an entirely alien planet. You can go explore that if you want to do something more fantasy based, and in, in you're know, rediscovering old magic that's suddenly come alive again in the world. You can do that if you want to do something historical based. You mm -hmm. can play through that more. Uh, uh, there's just a great variety of things that you can do. Yeah, and some something that I've always one one of the things that um i was that i was always curious about was <laughs> now i know i know um i know you had stepped on to the to the role of line director for um 8 for 1879 but what but um when it came to when it came to the early des, when it came to the early designs of it um what can you tell me about how it came about so it really started out primarily um, in the directions with the uh, the minis uh, mm -hmm. section, and we do actually have a miniatures line uh, for River Combat that's set up there. Yep. Uh, we, we had all these fantasy 
figure eights around you know you had it had elves you had dwarves that sort of thing mm -hmm. um a lot of them were from our demon world series another game world that uh, fast puts out uh, and then we were looking to develop these uh, you know figure eights for like the british they, they were just other options so we see these we got them put together and we're thinking how can we make a game around mixing these things together and that's really where the the brainchild kind of started uh, and the just as we were developing you know, come up with the backstory to be able to incorporate them. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of realized that, hey, we've got a pretty interesting world here. Let's do an RPG for it as well. Yeah. Um, and in that in that regard, was did was it was it always the plan to use the same um, step system that Earth Dawn uses, or were there initial were there initial attempts to use a different system? When I very first joined in, we were looking at using the Savage World system and starting to play around with mm -hmm. some of those mechanics. So I ended up having to learn a new, new set of mechanics for that. Um, but then we, the company had gone through some revisions with things. We ended up creating Earth on 4th Edition. And while mm -hmm. we're doing that, we realized, you know what? We've got the, the Corsup system developed in here. Let's pull this in let's make another game line that uses the same system yeah uh you know, they're linked together storyline wise uh so th there's already that type of a link let's link them mechanically mm -hmm. and now go now earth dawn of course is straight up um high fantasy bordering on epic fantasy whereas 1879 obviously is going obviously is going to be doing steampunk um and I, I know there, I know there's other aspects, but I'm sp I'm putting in broad strokes on this. Taking that into account, what were what were some of the things from or from um from the step system as it was defined in Earth Dawn that you looked at and you guys looked at and were like, eh, this doesn't qu this doesn't quite fit what 1879 needs to be. A lot of that comes in with the magic system, and it's really just a matter of where magic is in its development. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody who's not familiar with the system, the the, the entire background behind uh, the the cosmology with these mm -hmm. is that magic comes in cycles. It it, you know, it goes through a peak and a valley. Um, with Earth on, it is just after the peak end of things. Um, what happens when it reaches the peak? It goes through the stage called the scourge. Uh, basically kind of opens up like a floodgate and allows other world creatures called horrors to come in and sort of wreak havoc. So it's mm -hmm. you know, kind of post-apocalyptic in that regard. Uh, but, you know, we, we, the Earth Dawn has just come off of that peak. 1879 is just at the beginning of the level of where magic has started to return to the world. Um, there is a metagene within humanity that will come active once there's enough mana sufficient in the mm -hmm. world. Um, so that's where you get the rebirth of fantasy races. You get your elves, your dwarves, uh, your orcs, which in 1879 are called snarks. It's a uh, Lewis Carroll reference. That, that question gets asked a lot. <laughs> um, also brings it, uh, it introduces trolls. Mm -hmm. um, it, it introduces a lot of those sort of things. Uh, but with 1879, it's not at the high point yet. This is still all brand new. We're actually playing through the Awakening and dropping the Awakening right in the middle of the Victorian era uh, with, with all the social issues and that sort of thing going on. It's created a really interesting environment to play through if you're interested in the mm -hmm. social campaign. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, it, it, but then mostly with relation to how professions and that sort of thing have developed. We're not at the level where you can have uh, your, your Earth on adepts uh, where you know you get a misspell matrices and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. the the magic level just isn't quite there to support it yet. So we took similar concepts for that, but it's all skill based. Um, and then it just really in terms of your advancement and how you you level up, we had to to create that new to to kind of separate that out from. And in Arton, you have the the magic advancement where you just meditate, and in, it increases your your ranks and skills mm -hmm. and and, uh, and your talents for magical. Uh, for 1879, we, we had to do, come up with a system that was skill-based to, to be able to enhance that. Uh, I actually worked on that, and I actually stole a little bit from Call of Cthulhu uh, <laughs> with the idea of tagging skills. So you could, uh, as you use a skill, you're able to tag it. Once you've generated sufficient number of tags, you can then go on and buy up the next rank. Yeah. And now that now um. I do not want to underestimate. <laughs> I do not want to understate the fact that there are a lot of skills 
1879. A lot. Oh, definitely. And one of the things that I'm, one of the things that I'm always curious about because I've seen I've seen plenty of of skill based RPGs in, in the past, and a problem that some of them can have it, and this is something I've I seem to end up talking about at least on a weekly basis, is the issue of choice paralysis. And what I'm curious about is how is was that something that came up that came up in development about um, about people being t- too paranoid about too many skills and how do you mitigate this? Well, the way we break up the skills and it, it kind of helps with this for at least most of the advancements mm-hmm. uh, is you have a set number of skills that are going to be given to your profession as it advances and it's it's all listed out. Um, the, the companions will actually cover for the, the beginning professions uh, all the way to their end um, once they reach the apex. So you can see exactly all the skills that you have uh, that will be possible and can be given to you. You get, you get a set of pull. Um, so there, it is really limiting as far as when you've ranked up what skills you can actually pull from as far as your profession is concerned. Now, you can still get free skills and learn those otherwise, but that's really more to kind of flesh out a character, to, to pick up other things that you're not going to pick up through your profession already, uh, just to give sort of give you another means of, of adding some additional customization. Uh, but so to, while there is a very wide pool that is narrowed down each time you go to advance as far as which uh, skills you actually have in the pool that are available for you to take. Yep. And when it comes... Now... With that, with that kind of thing in mind. Now, the uh, step system that you, that you use. Obviously, we joked about the whole use all the dice, but right, right. When it co- when, and now, first off, I I should say I should say anybody who said says that it's using too much dice, that's that's a lie, because anybody worth their salt already has at least a pound's worth of dice as it is. And 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 anybody who's played Shadowrun at least one at least once in their life, or World of Darkness at least once in their life, they've already got at least three pounds worth of dice. I can get. I can. I would bet money on this fact. But when it com- but when it comes to using that many di- that many dice and that many varieties of dice, um, was there ever was there ever concerned about um? About making about keeping things from getting too swingy, and we've gone through some iterations mm-hmm. with the step system for that over the years, and it, mm-hmm. it really gets into the discrete mathematics of how it's developed. Uh, there's a couple of articles uh, I will actually reference Josh Harrison, uh, who does uh, Earth Dawn. He's had several articles on his personal site that have gone into detail phenomenally mm-hmm. to, to really describe how this works. Um, the key item with the step system is that the dice are open-ended high. If you max out a die roll, like 8 on a D8, you roll again and keep adding the results. And those exploding dice is where you really get a lot of the the, the open capabilities of the system. You're, you're not limited to just a linear, this is your start point, this is your end point range. No, it, the end can just keep going if you keep exploding the dice. Uh, but that also makes it a challenge mathematically. Is uh, Okay, how what are your odds of exploding the dice and then what are your odds of exploding again and it, there's more of a curve in how that goes through it's not just a strict linear progression um mm-hmm. we've gone through and there has been a bunch of rebalancing that has gone through to uh to handle this sort of thing with the current iteration of the system we've taken the d20 which d20 is the huge wild card within the uh the step system um that thing can swing so far um, so while on average, you know, the, with the, the earlier step systems, on average, the dice will generally work out whatever your step you're rolling. That's usually about or, or the result you're going to get. But the D20 throws the, the swing in there where you can tend to roll really low or you can tend to roll really high. Um, with current iteration, we've pushed that D20 out farther in the system uh, to a later stage where there's more dice available. And having those extra dice kind of evens out the curve a little bit more for you. So while you still hit, you can still have that massive swing, which can often swing in your favor, mm-hmm. uh, it could just as often go against you. So we've put, we by pushing that out a bit, uh, it, it sort of levels that out. So even if it does swing low, you've got a much better chance of some of your other dice kind of compensating and filling in for that. All right, that ma- that makes sense. Now. 
ori now originally the now currently you guys are cr are putting are putting in the crowd fund for the players and GMs companions and what I what I do find interesting about this is do is you guys are pl you guys are doing companions for both for both ends of the spectrum. Um, how, was that was this initially going to be one book that you guys split into t to two or how did how did it, uh, it um come to that decision? We were tr we had originally looked at doing one book, um, but when we started with the development and everything on it, mm -hmm. there's just way too much material to be able to cram it all into one book and keep it at a reasonable size. Uh, there, there is a ton of material, and there's a ton of material we had that we've just decided won't fit in these things um, that we've released through some of our blog posts and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, there is a wealth of a lot of it comes from real world history. There is a wealth of historical things that you, that you could throw into a game. If, if seriously, if you're ever looking for something weird or out there to, to develop a uh, you know within a world, mm -hmm. there's no better reference than real world history. They get up to some crazy shit in our past. Um, I but, no, uh, I've um. I will f I will freely admit that about half of the half of the magic items I've used in steampunk campaigns I shamelessly stole from watching way too many episodes of Forgotten Weapons um YouTube page. Absolutely, yeah, no, they are it's fantastic mm -hmm. for that sort of thing. And uh, it, just looking at some of the, some of the things that could have been developed and just never took that that one step. Yeah. Um, one of the big ones, and my primary contributor, but even before I became line developer, my primary one that I wrote was the mechanics for the uh, analytical engine, uh, which was mm -hmm. a real world thing. Yeah. Uh, devised by Charles Babbage, he just never actually got around to building the thing because he, while he was a brilliant man, he was a horrible project manager. Uh, and we just decided in our game world, no, this is going to happen. Uh, the British government just comes in, takes over the project from him, and just retains him as a consultant so that it actually did get developed. Yeah, and for those unaware of their history, the analytical engine is essentially the prototype for the first computer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, steam, steam and clockwork, and it, based, it worked based off of very specific gear positionings and how they were machined. Yeah, and uh, MIT actually did a few years ago. Um, they built a copy of the the machine according to Babbage's original specifications, and it actually did work. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the actual first computer was the uh, was the Mark One in in the um, I think it was the fifties. Mm -hmm. It could only do two edition problems a, a second. So look how far we've come since. Now, with now. Within the two books, um, what would you estimate the p putting aside any additions from like stretch goals that obviously I can't predict because um, unfortunately my crystal ball is in the shop. Um, what would you say is going to be the page size estimate for the players and GM's companions? We're still getting the layout finalized, so it's hard to put a, a hard and fast number on that right now. Um, uh, we try. We try to keep it within, uh, the, with just within our printer. There's powers of eight mm -hmm. uh, for where we get run into the price breaks. So we try to make it work within there. Um, you know, so we usually have like a one twenty eight to two fifty six, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to keep it within those sort of uh, page balances. I believe, if I remember correctly, what our current estimate is is the GMs would run around one twenty eight, and then the players would be oh now i gotta do math <laughs> sorry i ended with the day job here uh, uh 192 if i remember mm -hmm. correctly um now again th those numbers are up to fluctuation because we're still waiting for the, the last layout to come through but if i remember correctly that's around about what it was yeah now when it cut now when it comes to when it come, now, when it comes to the when it comes to the books, um, I can kind I can kind of make a guess as to what as to what's going to be in the player's companion. Um, the nickname for this kind of thing is that I've always had is the toy box. Um, you know, a lo little bit of a little bit of everything for players. So, little, <clears throat> just just more options for what players can ar can already do. 
But when it comes to the player's companion, will there, will there be any will there be any um mecha- any new kinds of mechanics that are going to be um put into the sandbox? Uh, so a lot of what we've done, and this is between the two books, mm-hmm. is we've actually opened up that that toy box or toolkit uh, for things. So not only does it give you existing tools that you can go ahead and you know just further add on to, but we actually give you a lot of the rule sets and, and the basis behind how we've developed things to keep them balanced. So a lot of your your main tool and your your new thing you're going to be able to do is actually be able to create your own uh, things within game um, spell creation. Um, programming on uh, the analytical engines, like we had mentioned before, you can actually write custom programs, and there are rules developed for how you can do those sort of things. So you can mm-hmm. follow the process and actually go through, uh, you know, within your character uh, to develop a program, and then ha- have your resulting test results and that sort of thing to be able to make your your challenge ratings. Yep. Um, but but yeah, that's kind of a theme between the two books is we're opening up the toolbox so you can you know help fill in and customize within your own world. All right, that that um def- that definitely makes sense. Now, one of the, now um, it also mentioned in the uh, Kickstarter it mentions variant professions. Um, how similar or different f- to to um nor- to normal professions would those be? And what can you tell me? What could you tell me about what you're uh, shooting for when it comes to those variants? So really what we're doing with the variants is to be able to give you a if you wanted to play a little different flair on mm-hmm. things. Or, or you'll take a little bit different basis from an existing profession. You can use the existing skill pool that's there. Uh, it, it's really just you know changing the focus a little bit around. Maybe you switch out one of the professional skills for the core skill. Uh, you know, may, maybe you move a couple things around. It, it, it's really it's similar to the process for creating a whole new profession, but it's really just kind of a light version of that. So if you don't want to go through the process of building something entirely from scratch and figure out the balance, just take what's there and move a couple things around and use creative variants. Um, our prime example of this was the one when I actually pitched this when it was originally developed. Uh, we had the, the writing done for the cowboy profession mm-hmm. and you know, took a realistic approach. You know, the, the, the focus of a cowboy is animal husbandry. That, that is the core skill. You know, they're, they're herders. And that's their goal is to, to look after their, you know, their uh, herds of cow and, and move them across to, to get them to slaughter, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but looking in that Wild West profession and thinking about things that people are going to play with, you know, you'd have sort of that rough and tumble, you know, you know the, 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 the usual American West mm-hmm. iconic imagery. Uh, yeah. So I'm like, okay, let's swap the core skill out with firearms, uh, play the, you know, change the focus around a little bit, drop the social level, and make a very profession for the outlaw. Mm-hmm. The skills are very similar because they're from a similar environment. You're just putting that different flair on it. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, just makes it makes it a light version, so you can very quickly, you know, adjust the variants. I'm I'm going to move one or two things around, and boom, I can jump right in. Mm-hmm. Now, when it now, uh, now um, when it comes to the warden and master tiers, um, like when it comes to when it comes to the tier system, the 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 question that the question that I have is what's what sort of what was be the adventuring scale for the, for those kind of tiers. Uh, so once you get into the warden and master tiers, that's mm-hmm. where you, you're getting into the real serious. You know, you are seasoned veterans. You, you you're professionals. You know what you're doing. You've been around the bush. <laughs> you know, you've been around enough to actually be able to handle some really serious uh, trouble that, that's coming your way. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in a lot of that basis is also for being able to break up some of the skills a little bit uh, by being able to break it up to, within the different tiers. It's just another degree of separations, like you had mentioned earlier about the the choice paralysis. You can eliminate some of that because some of the really high end stuff that sounds really cool, you got to wait until you get that tier available before you can grab it. So it makes it you know, it eases that off a little bit uh, just by giving it a separate category where it actually becomes available for you. Yeah. Now I can guess what skill necks are going to be, based on, based on the based on the name based on the nomenclature and what that ten, what that tends to apply when it comes to skills. But what exactly does um, skill necks do for the skill system? 
Uh, so it's really pretty much the same thing that the Talent Knack system does for Earthdawn. Mm -hmm. um, it's just some extra tricks, custom ways that you can use an existing skill. Um, just opens things up so you can do th do things a little bit easier, uh, or, or you know, do something very specific that's not quite th that's kind of related to a particular skill, but not quite covered mm -hmm. uh, exactly. It, you get a knack to create for that. You know, it, it's something where it's it's close enough that it's not worth creating an entire new skill for. Uh, but you, you still want to have some extra rule set to give it that little bit of a degree of separation that, you know, sometimes there's an extra hurdle going to go through, you know, maybe an extra you know, point of strain or two, or maybe it's just that you have to do the training to learn this particular trick. All right. And now when it comes, now, obviously, given, given the importance of magic's rise and fall, when it comes to the new, ma when it comes to the uh, new magic mechanics, um, what are some of the what are some of the ways that the spellcasting sandbox is going to be expanded? Uh, well, aside from being able to create your own spells, um, and you, we have opened it up where you have both your base spells and your known as variants or KAVs. Mm -hmm. The way the the magic system works here, it's so much of it is based on the secret societies and the, the different organizations. Um, within 1870, again, because this is all brand new and everybody's just finally rediscovering, they haven't really unified a lot of the, the, the different ways that people approach magic and that sort of thing. And the way the magic system works within this universe is a lot of it is you know, uh, belief creates reality. It mm -hmm. is one of the major uh, focuses of it. So having that uh, with that in mind, different groups are going to approach magic in different ways. You have the galvanic mages that will take a little bit more of a scientific approach to it um, versus the Anglican Church, which views them, you know, their spells as miracles and in, in being granted that way. Um, so you have the base spell, which is basically essentially just mechanically, this is what you, you know, the, the particular spell. So you don't have to create a custom, you know, a, damn, a ranged attack spell for every single group. It, you have, this is the base spell that you're working off of. But then within that group, you have a known as variant, mm -hmm. uh, and that lets you put your particular custom flare on it. So, you know, the, the, you know, the galvanic mages may be able to create a lightning bolt based off of a static charge, uh, you know, and, and then use the same example in English Church, but they have some sort of like a sunburst or something like that that, that would do, you will know, have more of a holy aspect to it. Uh, you know, it just lets you to put that different flair on magic when you're creating that. Uh, so you, you actually have that opened up where you can create those sort of things. Uh, the other big one that's being added is we have the fetishes and foci. Uh, these will take a little bit of the strain off of a spellcaster. Essentially, you, you would create your own device that works as sort of a buffer and can take some of that damage for you. Um, frees you up a lot more to, to really push your spellcasting you know, further or longer uh, with the rules that, that you have where you can take additional strain points to add you know, add some extra things and that sort of thing into it, having your, you know, and, and, and the fetish and foci is really just dependent upon what type of magic casting you do. Uh, but having that buffer there to take some of the strain off of you makes it a lot easier for you to, to be able to do things in the middle of combat and not have to worry about straining yourself unconscious. Mm -hmm. And... When now, when it comes to now, when it comes to the um, GM end of things, what would you what would you say what would you say is the uh, big is going to be the biggest addition that that um, book will add, will add to the GM's end end of the sandbox? I.e., what's what's the biggest thing that the GM is probably going to use to screw over the players? Because let's admit it, every GM has a bit of a sadist in them. Oh, we've got, yeah, there's opened up a, a lot of fun things in there. Um, one, we have included the information for dragons, so mm -hmm. you do have that uh, in there to play with. Uh, you know, that opens up for, for some really high-end stuff. Uh, we've added a bunch of additional critters and that sort of thing to, for some stuff to play in. And there is one chapter that I've alluded to that, that uh, I added into the books as what I took out as line developer that I haven't released just yet. Uh, to actually say what it is, I'm keeping that in my pocket until the books actually come out, at least until there's a preview. So I keep dropping hints about it. If you do check on the uh, the website, there's blog posts. I'm leading up to that. I've got the storyline that's been established that, that's sort of leading in. Mm -hmm. And when now, when it comes to when it comes to um, 
it's interesting that dragons is one of the, is one of the things that is brought up because there's always I've, for a long time there's been there's been a discussion that's been nicknamed "Do you stat dragons?" Um, ostensibly, the idea being that if so, if um that if that if something has stats in the then the players will try and see if they could kill it and get and get XP for it. Um, I have now I have my take on the whole thing, but. How do you feel about the whole idea of stat of statting something like dragons? Well, it, it is an interesting quandary when he gets into that one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's the thing is with a lot of them, they are at some point they do still have their limits. Yeah. The only reason to not stat something is if it is just completely limitless. Um, but at that point, you, you know, you could just be running it by a GM fiat and, and which, I mean, you can do when the situation calls for it. And if there's something particular that's essential to the story, you may not bother, bother with the stats. Yeah. But uh, for as far as something to include in the game, in, in you know, development within the line, you really do kind of need to stat it because it, it, it is, you know, they are still mortal. They are still limits, even mm -hmm. if those limits are insanely high. Yeah. And me, per me personally, I've had the attitude of, yes, I stat dragons, but that doesn't mean I have to stat them fairly. Mm, exactly. Oh. And obvious, obviously, in this case, I'm not referring to dragon specifically. That's just, that's just the um, placeholder because I need so I need something fancy to use for this <laughs> particular line right. of thinking. You need, you need something for the develop for the uh, the analogy. Yeah. Well, and the other point is, while you may stat the dragons, that doesn't mean you've actually got stats written for all their fancy gadgets because they've had some time to build up some stuff. Yeah, and. Well, let's be honest. The idea, the idea of a dragon having enough time and and intelligence, because because we're because we're dealing with dragons, not wa not wyverns, um, to to um, construct or have or have somebody construct. God God help you a drag. God help you a dragon in steampunk armor. That's um that's a horrifying thought, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So. It's like. A, dra a dragon alone is bad enough. Now you get, now you give a dragon access to technology, and then to, and then tell them to have at it. These are the kind of things that keep me up at night, folks. Now <laughs> these are the kind of things that I put into writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you put into writing so that other pe so so that you can fall so that you can fall asleep and other people get nightmares. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Um. Now it talks about an updated it talks about an updated timeline and that brings me to one that brings me to one question and this is a question that I've seen in plenty of other games that have a whole lot of lore when it comes to their setting what is your feelings on meta plot um for me personally uh, I like having a meta plot there where it is available for people to mm -hmm. run with but when you're running your personal campaign, that is your own universe. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what I'm doing as a developer within the game, I am creating a sandbox. I am creating a meta plot that's there, but you can follow or not follow it as you choose. You yeah. may have a game that has completely deviated from that, and that's totally fine. It's your game world. And at that point, when you're running it at your table, it is your game. It is no longer mine. I've mm -hmm. just given you the tools to start with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. That which is a which is a fair point to make. So I'm am guessing when it comes to the, when it comes to this updated timeline, it's not it wouldn't be doing anything that would deviate too far far off where cer where certain things can only be accessible at a at a given t at a given timeline. You're, it's just adding it's just um putting a few more feet in the total um square feet of the of uh, the sandbox. Right, we're, we're continue to add some things out and. We do have an interesting one with ours because there is a basis in real world history. Mm -hmm. We have it, it, it's not quite a hard and fast rule if we can find a reason to you know, justify it. Um, but we do try to limit certain things and when certain technologies and devices and that sort of thing would become available and you know tie it in within the real world time frame. Um, so that there is a if for that reason with our game specifically, there is a reason to advance the timeline further because that opens up additional gadgets as things were made within the real time frame. Um, now again, we'll play with that that rule. It's not kept hard and fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we we can pull things from earlier in there if we have a particular you know, uh, have a sufficient reason for it 
and can it can develop reasons. In, in particular, we'll also do things um, if magic could have made this particular thing happen sooner, uh, or if there was a historical event that cha- that we changed in our timeline that could have made this develop. We'll, we'll we'll free those things up a little bit, but but because we have that basis, there is a reason for us to keep advancing. Yeah. Now, when it comes. Now, of course. Now, when it comes to when it comes to um new beings, is is that going is obviously you can't go into all you can't go into all of it. Otherwise, that'd be a giant spoiler. But when it comes to some of the new beings, are we are we talking full on new races within the Grove, or are we are we talking um new, are we talking new races within um Earth as well? There's a mix of things going on. Um, we're where I'm taking the meta plot and just kind of how we're directing things, we're going to focus more on going through the rabbit hole, going in and developing the grub, and that's where our mm-hmm. future books are going to spend a lot of their focus on. Um, we're, the very next book that's planned to come out is going to be Fort Alice, uh, which focuses on the British fort, their forces within the grub, mm-hmm. and the surrounding areas, and how they're they're focusing on colonizing and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. We have we there was originally planned to add a creatures chapter in that book, but after the discussion, we're like, you know what? No, we've got too many ideas, and that's too much of a, a, a of a big thing to include as just a chapter in another book. So we're actually talking. We want to uh, down the road create an entire separate book of creatures within the grove, um, mm-hmm. just to add to to that sort of complexity. There is sort of a, a background to the Grove and with things which is not and probably never will be revealed to the public for how we're basing a lot of these. Uh, but, the, but there is a, a sort of lore there that drives some of that. And it's, it, like I said, it's just giving us too many ideas. We can't cram it into a chapter. We need to, to do an entire devoted book to, to taking a look at that from there. Um, as far as things within Earth, yes, there are definitely going to be things opened up within Earth. And again, the, the chapter that I alluded to that is going to be introducing some, some new creatures which have not been seen before in, in Earth. Again, I won't spoil it, mm-hmm. but uh, but I'm just alluding that, yes, there is definitely going to be something new there. Yeah. And when it comes... Now, when it comes to... When it, when, it comes to bo- when it comes to both of the, both of the um, companions... Um, this is this is where I have to delve into into something that ends up being a bit ends up being a bit of an issue in some in some games more more than others, and that is the power creep problem. Um, because a lot a lot of times when I see games get expansions, what ends up happening is that the expansions in more recent books end up being more useful than what was in the uh, core material, and has that can, has that question been brought up when it comes to expanding the sandbox that you guys have, and how have you worked to mitigate that problem? It is an interesting problem, and it's one, at least as far as 1879 is concerned, we haven't really had to deal with directly too much because this is all still first edition. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the game hasn't been around enough to develop a second or third edition or anything like that where we've encountered these things before. We're still establishing a lot of that baseline. Uh, as far as you know, keeping things relevant, that sort of thing. Obviously, we want to give people new ideas, new tools, things to keep the game interesting and, and add new flair to things. Mm-hmm. But we, a lot of that is we are continuing to fall back. We have a particular formula for how we develop things and keep it all based. So it, it does stay, even if it's a brand new development and how it came out, it is still based within the existing structure for how everything prior to that was developed. And again, within the companions, we open up that toolbox to show people this is our process behind the scenes. So you can see so that it, you know your homebrew stuff, if you want to develop, you can use that same formula that we're using to develop things and keep it all within balance. And, you know, obviously, there's always room for something to, to kind of go awry as a, as a one-off. But for the most part, it should all remain relatively within spec with each other. Mm-hmm. And when it com- when it comes to to shift to shift things a, to shift things a bit, you did mention a um, method when it comes to when it comes to spell creation. Um, is the, is that going to is that going to work on a bit of a po- a bit of a point by approach, or is it or is it going to be a, is it going to be a bit more freeform? Yeah. Uh- 
a little bit of a combination. Uh, mm-hmm. The basis for it really is kind of point by, just as far as keeping everything balanced and that sort of thing is concerned. Mm-hmm. But you you have some freeform options to be able to add things in. Uh, you, it's not just limited to this is your column. You can only have X number of combinations. Uh, it, there, it is available for you to be able to make certain rulings. Like, like oh, one of the things you can get extra points by having a particular restriction and that sort of thing. All uh, the example is you need a source of fire or you, know, you need something to be able to draw it for. But it's not strictly defined it, within there. So it, you know, it, it does have it leave it open for GM and a player to have a dialogue. And, okay, how does this sound balanced? Okay, this probably fits within Tier 1. This probably fits within Tier 2. That's, that's sort of a, a discussion. Uh, so while you have the point by to, to keep it relatively within spec so that everything, you know, you don't have everything going crazy off the rails from each other, um, it, there is still free form where you can let your imagination sort of run a little bit. Mm-hmm. Now, take, now taking all, taking all, all that into, all that into account, um, now even, even though the, even though the, um, Obviously, the core material is get, is going to be focusing more on the on the uh, British Empire perspective. Do you have plans to d- to dip into other perspectives as well? Yes, most definitely. Um, there's been some allusions to things within the the existing. Mm-hmm. Um, haven't quite gotten into that portion just yet. As far as within the timeline, within uh, since I've taken over as line developer and where I'm directing things. Our focus is going to be mostly on the grub with the British starting their march there. Mm-hmm. That's going to come to an apex within the meta plot, and then as that meta plot, uh, as that concludes, we sort of go into a next story arc. Uh, it is really kind of the the idea behind it. And as we move into that next story arc, that's going to start opening up a lot more perspectives. Um, eventually, the pendulum will swing back through the rabbit hole back to the Earth side, and that's where we'll start to open things up more. Yeah, because obviously, obviously, when you, when you have some when you have a change that um, accelerates technology to um, to this level, obviously that's going to have a ripple effect not not just within the British Empire but also elsewhere. Oh, definitely, and and ripple effects are one of the huge ones that we look for within the game line. Mm-hmm. You know, the the smallest change can create the biggest uh, changes in in flex, just how the story ends up developing. Yes, yeah, yeah. We've all we've all read about the butterfly effect at one point. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, current now currently, you got currently you've got it at about at um. At a goal of at, you had a goal of five thousand at the time at the time of this speaking, um, you guys are at seven point six thousand. Which congratulations. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? As far as the pricing is concerned. Um, no, as, as far as far as as far as the as far as the um, la- as far as a launch time. I I realize that a lot of this is in flux. Um, right, yeah, that's why I'm asking. Out. That's why I'm asking for a window, like like say, for, like say, first or second quarter 2021 or something like that. We are hoping to have a lot of that depends upon printer. Mm-hmm. Um, the goal right now, we we're finishing up the layout and everything. We just had a meeting Wednesday. Um, from what I understand, the goal right now, our our art director is doing the final pass, making sure the art gets put in exactly how he wants it for layout in the books. Uh, the goal is to have that completed by the end of this month. So when the Kickstarter campaign closes, we will be able to turn the PDFs around almost immediately. Uh, once we're able to, to put the final touches on that and get the PDFs ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, it then goes out to the printers. And it's really just a matter of the printer production schedule. Um, obviously, some of that can fluctuate a little bit, especially with it coming close to the end of the year. You get the holidays and that sort of thing. Uh, but we're really hoping to have this out uh, within the first quarter next year to actually get the print books out to people. So yeah. we're, we're looking for a really quick turnaround time. Now, and of now, um, it's interesting that you mentioned layout because obviously, given the um, given the time fr- given the time frame that eighteen seventy nine is rooted in, um, it's tr- it's trying to u- it's trying to use the same the same sort of presentation you would see in a book in that in that era. 
how easy or difficult has has it been to lay has been to lay that out? Layout has been one of our biggest challenges, and a lot of it's just uh, you, know, you know getting uh, consistent work within mm-hmm. that sort of style. Uh, so the, you know, that definitely has been a challenge. I think we've we've got a pretty good formula for it now. Um, and it's just a matter of you making sure we have a, uh, a you know group that can consistently deliver within that same formula. Yeah. Um, but one of what that was one of my early actions when I took over as line developer was going through and actually creating a layout guide um, just for all the head, different heading styles and that sort of thing to to make sure we have a consistent theme throughout the books. Uh, I am trying to open it up a little bit more, and you'll see with some of the later books that the original players and game masters guide were done to you know the covers were done to look. Like it was just a simple leather bound volume, mm-hmm. uh, which has a look that's reminiscent for the time period. It, it works there. Mm-hmm. But when you see it sitting on a gaming shelf, it's not always as eye catching compared to some of the other ones. So I've, I've, that's one that we've uh, added into. And one that I'm really pushing for is definitely to make sure we have you know, nice, vibrant color pieces uh, mm-hmm. that are interesting to take a look at. Um, so you'll, you'll start to see those open up a little bit more as we progress over with, with more books. That, you know, try to get something that's a little more eye-catching that way, which may not necessarily have worked within the period, but it's something that you know modern players are going to be able to associate. And then as far as seeing the book volumes on your shelf, the the spine vo- the uh, spine layout that's all going to remain the same. So when it's yeah. on your shelf, it looks like it is just a, a, a regular old leather bound volume. Yeah. Um. So, if I got the, if I heard that right, there before you came in, there wasn't a um, there wasn't a layout guide. Uh, we again, we were still kind of developing things. Mm-hmm. We had a general idea for how we wanted things to look, but we hadn't fully gone through and established, like I said, just all the different heading styles and that sort of thing, and had it particularly locked down. Um, yeah. Again, this is first edition. And we're we're still piecing a lot of those together, uh, but so that was one of my first ones. Let's go through and okay, take the stuff that we've established within the books already, and let's formally create this out. It, we, there was a general guideline, but not anything formally written out. Um, yeah. So, so that was one of the ones that I created. Was just just so we can actually hand it to a layout person and say we want this section to look like this. We want this section to look like this one, and and be able to actually pick, you know. Well, you know, one through five, or or however I can't remember how many different layout eggs we had. Uh, I'd have to go pull the document up again. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but basically, you can literally pick by numbers. Yeah. Now, when it com- when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the um, flow of th- of things, um, given given this whole emphasis on layout, there's obviously there's been some learn there's been some learning experiences. What between between the between um the initial initial launch and so and some of the expansion material that's come about since this is still a first edition what would you say have been some of the big takeaways when it comes to developing um 1879 and what and what do you think the team has um learned from the experience thus far oh that is a really good one um I think a lot of it more kind of comes through with mechanics and things. And some of this was stuff that we had sort of anticipated was going to happen. Uh, you know, essentially, no battle plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Mm-hmm. Uh, anytime you get something out into the general public, there's always going to be someone comes up with an idea that you never anticipated. You know, for X number of solutions that GM comes up with to a game, the players are going to come up with X plus one. Uh, so a lot of that we had anticipated that, yeah, there, there's going to be some new things that, that really sort of develop that way as far as mechanically speak is concerned. We have some ideas for things that if we do get get around to doing a second edition for some things we would streamline, um, a couple of things that are, are maybe a little bit clunky at this particular point. Uh, part of it was when this was in development, Earth on 4th edition had not fully come out yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Earth on 4th edition, which is where we based most of our mechanics on, um, was since that was still kind of coming around, we had to fill in some of those gaps. And there's a little bit of, uh, of, of a disconnect with some of them. So if we ever do get around to making a second edition, there's some things that I did that I definitely would like to streamline that way. Uh, as far as, far as that, how everything would develop mechanically and that sort of thing, mostly with character advancement. I've, that's the big one that I've gotten feedback from with people is that the, the character advancement seems to be uh, a little bit cumbersome. So 
but the, the, yeah, this is a first edition. This is a brand new one. So th there's some things that you know, we needed to get out with people to be, to be able to, to get some of that fluctuation. So if we ever get to that point, that would be something to, to go through. The mechanic basis would always, it, of course, would be the same, just like with the, uh, the Earth on editions, whenever those were had come out. Pretty much all mm -hmm. the previous material still works within later editions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that would be the plan if we ever get around to that. We don't have any immediate plans to do a second edition or anything like that right at this point. We're still, still developing source material right now. But if we ever do get to the point where, okay, it, we, we need to streamline some things, we need to modify some stuff to, to make a second edition, that would be where a lot of the focus is. Yeah, I can I can definitely um I can definitely see that. Now with with all with all of that said, because of because of my particular um gimmick and because of the fact that I've gotten on peop on people for not having this Here's the million dollar question. Will both books have an index? <laughs> oh yes. That that is one that I'm definitely pushing for is to have an index for the books. Mm-hmm. I know, I know that I know that sometimes having an index can be um, tr can make things tricky when it comes to um, when it comes to formatting. But I think it's one of those things that's worth that's worth it in the long run, especially with all the stuff that's going to be in the books. No, definitely. No, I, I am a big believer of you know, indexing your material, especially when it's source material mm -hmm. uh, for that sort of thing when you're getting to that. For an adventure book, okay, you probably don't need an index for that because that's all a very linear progression. It's not that big of a deal. Um, yeah. it, and those books tend, don't tend to be quite as long. But when you're doing source material, you know, whether it is a core rule book like these are, I mean, especially when it's a core rule book, but then also just you know, additional sources and that sort of thing. It is definitely useful to be able to have that that index as a reference, and yes, no, I am a big proponent of indexes. Mm -hmm. And of course, and of course, I'll be I'll be keeping a close eye on on how it on how it turns out, and definitely looking forward to seeing the kind of in, seeing the kind of um, insan insanity that that comes to play. Um, although I although I did announce to my table that. If I end up running 1879 in the future, anybody who sings Rule Britannia will be will be subject to the pain glass. <laughs> Don't worry, it's nothing terrible. They just have to drink a bottle of bacon soda. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, no, I'm a big fan of bacon, so that may not be too bad. <laughs> no, even even people I know who are fans of bacon don't want to touch that stuff. I specifically it, got it so. because nobody would willingly want to drink it. Even I don't want it. That's why I use it as a punishment. But uh, well, my, my plan for punishment on uh, my players, I have a set of uh, dice that I picked up. They're hematite. If you've ever seen polished <laughs> hematite dice, they are in this deep, dark, like gunmetal, almost black <laughs> color, and they are heavy. They have a big weight to them. Uh, one of my plans is to build a nice big black lacquer case for them with skulls and that sort of thing I'll put on them, and I'm going to keep it in the freezer. And whatever player is the one that sets off the big baddie, they're the one that has to go to the freezer and get me the horror dice. <laughs> People say and, I'm evil. <laughs> and when they ask why they're kept in the, the freezer, I look at them and just square in the eye and I say, because they roll better cold. <laughs> I um okay. I'm probably gonna have to. I'm probably gonna have to lift that lift that one if I ever get the it chance. Feel free. <laughs> um, you're you're kind you're kind of proving my you're kind of proving my point about what I said about DMs earlier that <laughs> that they all have a bit of sadism in them. Um, yeah. some uh, some of it just more than others. But hey, but hey, if you but hey, are you really DMing if your if your play if your players aren't paranoid every time you roll a dice behind that screen? Exactly. You know, you have to make them terrified. <laughs> so, I mean, that, one that's part of your fun as a DM is getting to see everybody squirm. Uh, but two, you got to because you are the DM, you're in control of both good and evil. You yeah. got to keep them guessing. And I'm guessing sometimes you'll you'll roll even though you don't need to just to, just to keep them on their toes. Absolutely, Th those are the best ones. <laughs> yeah, but 
But with that said, I'm definitely going to be looking forward to seeing how how it devel how it develops. Um, and with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to come all the way up to the temp all the way up to the temple and brave the hell that is time zones to in to enjoy to enjoy a drink with us here in these hallowed halls. Oh, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate mm -hmm. uh, getting get the chance to come in and just talk about the stuff that I love to do. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Amen to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!